start the talk, uh, I was reflecting that um, knowing that transition will be in the news a lot here in the Northwest Territories, I suspect now many of you, like I, have heard the transition in the news um, from several vantage points over the past number of weeks as well. And so I just, uh, as a point of survey, went on to uh, Google News and um, to acquaint myself with some of the more recent stories on transition uh, about which uh, you may or may not be um, familiar. And, and I was struck by what I found. Um, I found stories about whether or not the transition would be successful in Syria uh, if they kept Bashir al-Assad as the president of Syria. I found stories about um, the transition of power in Burkina Faso leading to a coup d'etat. Um, read a story about the recent transition of power in Australia where um, fellow conservative Malcolm Turnbull uh, pushed out Prime Minister uh, Abbott um, in, a, in a power struggle within the party, similar to what we've seen uh, in a, other Australian parties over the past number of decades. And what I was struck by was how much we benefit in Canada from the smooth transition of power uh, federally in the provinces and indeed in the Northwest Territories. That has become a hallmark of Canadian democracy uh, and I think is a point that is not uh, remarked on often enough. To underscore the point, <clears throat> one of my favorite quotations about transition comes from Graham White, uh, a longtime student of Northern Government who of course is resident in Toronto and be, be familiar to some of you. Um, but in this case, uh, he wrote a book writing about transition in Ontario. Um, and I think this may uh, resonate with some of you in the audience about the uncertainty uh, that arises during periods of government transition, regardless of the perspective you take, whether you're a public servant, uh, a member of, of the general public, a newly elected MLA, or even a person who wasn't successful in the most recent general election, perhaps wasn't re-elected. In this case, uh, Professor White and Professor Cameron were writing about a new Tory um, political advisor coming into the Harris government in 95. And Graham writes, Flushed with the excitement of victory and eager to get an early start, he entered the fourth floor of the Whitney block where the cabinet office is located. You can think of maybe the legislative assembly here or the Lang building downtown. It seemed cavernous but deserted and he had the eerie sense of apprehensive bureaucrats furtively watching him from behind the potted palms and the filing cabinets. I felt, he recalls, like the first Viet Cong soldier cycling into Saigon after the Americans had left. <laughs> White goes on to write about uh, transition planning perhaps not being uh, done as well as it could be to prepare for an incoming administration. And I hope what we're going to illustrate here tonight is um, the seriousness with which the public service in the Northwest Territories has this year and has for many years brought to transition planning. And I think that's evidence of uh, the seriousness with which public administrations across the country bring seriousness to the transition planning process to make sure that there is a smooth transfer of power from one government to another, or from one group of elected officials to another. Um, and the priority setting process and the leadership selection that I think in part uh, touches on the distinct aspects of consensus government in Northwest Territories. And on those points, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Mercer, to elaborate further. Thank you, David. Um, I don't have any funny stories, but I think I've got a cartoon here somewhere. Um, so those of you who can't read it, this is uh, Pearls Before Swine. Pig, you and I have been arguing a lot lately. I think it's time we try to reach a fair consensus. What's a consensus? It's where we get together and I state my opinion and you state your opinion and then we agree to my opinion. That doesn't seem fair. He says, believe me, I listen carefully to your opinion before I mock it. <laughs> so um, that, that's obviously a joke. And uh, you know, there's one of the things that I find curious about consensus government is how, is how much dialogue there is about the nature of consensus government in the run up to major electoral events and how little there is uh, once those events are over. Um, you know, in my view, uh, this type of discussion needs to be ongoing and, and uh, taking place from one event to another. Uh, so what we're going to talk about tonight a little bit about consensus government. We could talk for hours about consensus government. It is a very unique system. Um, it's unique from the way we do uh, legislation. It's unique from the way we uh, adopt and debate budgets. Uh, it's unique almost entirely um, across the spectrum of activities. But tonight we're going to talk about just a couple of, of areas um, where consensus government differs from a traditional party-based system, and that is largely, as David has mentioned, uh, in terms of how priorities are set and in terms of how leadership is selected. A um, couple of disclaimers first. Um, everything that we're going to talk about tonight is subject to the approval of the 18th 
Legislative Assembly once it's sworn in. And that's, I think, indicative of the fact that nothing we're going to talk about tonight is enshrined in legislation, virtually nothing. Um, unlike uh, many of the constitutional conventions that exist uh, at the federal level or even at the provincial level, almost everything we're going to discuss tonight uh, is a matter of political convention. And it is subject to review uh, and um, adoption and a complete uh, uh, change by the incoming legislative assembly. What we're going to talk about are largely the way things have been done um, and what the outgoing legislative assembly has recommended for the incoming legislative assembly. Second disclaimer is we're not here to defend consensus government. There's a, a, a valid and a, a very strong debate about uh, the system of government parliamentary democracy that exists in the Northwest Territories. Our role is not to defend it. The system, I believe, belongs to all Northerners and it belongs to the practitioners of, of consensus government, uh, being the MLAs. Uh, and it's their job to defend it. Our job is, is largely to explain it. And what we hope to do tonight is, is explain a couple of aspects of it and answer any questions that you have. Um, and finally, uh, you're not going to hear any dirty secrets tonight. Everything that we're going to tell you is a matter of, of public record, um, either enshrined in, leg in, in legislation, in, in uh, uh, transition reports from the last uh, Legislative Assembly, and in a series of, of consensus government protocols and procedures that have been adopted over the last 12 years, largely to try and uh, clarify what exactly this strange creature of consensus government really is. So uh, with those dis disclaimers having been said, I'm going to move on to the, to the next slide. And I, guarantee, I promise you we only have two or three slides. The first one is virtually unreadable. <coughs> so you've got a copy of it. And this is sort of just to show in a very, in a very mechanistic way what's, what lies ahead. So you know, we've just come off, off election night. Um, next Tuesday is sort of when all of the newly elected MLAs uh, will show up for their first day of work. And you know, for the last two or three transitions, we have tried to separate the newly elected MLAs from uh, the remainder uh, of the 19, just to sort of give them some quiet time to learn where the bathrooms are, uh, learn the names of people, uh, you know, ask some questions that they might uh, not be comfortable asking. Um, and one of the assumptions, and here's one of the dangers and assumptions, and one of the dangers of, of assuming that consensus government doesn't change, is invariably, at least in the four transitions I've been involved in, we have planned for and received roughly 33% turnover. We plan for it in terms of budgeting, we plan for it in terms of space, office allocation, a whole series of things. Uh, well, those of you who are paying attention uh, Monday night, that assumption went out the window. Uh, we're now facing probably uh, the largest turnover, one of the largest turnovers in, in the modern history of the Legislative Assembly. 11 newly elected MLAs, many with a, a great deal of, of experience uh, in various aspects of public life and private life. Uh, but you know the level of turnover is virtually unprecedented. So you know we're going to be sitting with a, with a group of 11 people now, as opposed to what we're not used to with four or five. So most of next week is going to be spent on what we call uh, administrative orientation, payroll, um, you know, getting their paperwork done. A little bit of a, a primer on consensus government. Um, Kevin O'Reilly's here. Sorry, Kevin, you're probably going to hear all this again next week. Um, and uh, it, then on Thursday, Thursday afternoon and on Friday is when the group of 19 finally get together for the first time and they start making their way down this four-year path together as a governing body. Uh, the second week is, uh, is uh, highlighted by swearing-in ceremony that's going to take place on the 8th of December. We've got a number of recounts, administrative judicial recounts that we need to take, uh, take care of. 8th of December is officially swearing-in day and that's when um, the members of the 18th Legislative Assembly officially become members. The rest of that week is then spent um, on you know, more substantive orientation matters, uh, getting briefed on um, outstanding issues from the public service, um, getting briefed on um, what some of the recommendations were from the previous Legislative Assembly. And then on the weekend, um, again, this is all um, subject to the approval of the, of the Legislative Assembly, but in previous assemblies, um, there has been a, a deliberate effort to consult with Aboriginal leaders, Aboriginal and community government leaders. Uh, prior to the selection of a cabinet and prior to any type of agreement on, on governing priorities. And that's scheduled to take place on uh, Saturday, December the 12th. Um, now in terms of, of what's different this time around, after that series of administrative substantive orientations, uh, consultations with uh, Northern leaders, the members of the Legislative Assembly will, for the first time, on uh, December the 14th, speak to the public. Um, as MLAs. They've just come off uh, an election campaign, so they've been speaking to the public, of course, quite a bit. Uh, 
But this is the first time in the 14th where MLAs will get a chance to publicly say what it is they want to achieve, what their own priorities are um, as a legislative assembly for the next four years. What's different this time, um, what what's been recommended by the previous assembly, typically that discussion takes place in this room right up here, the caucus room. Um, it's typically an in-camera discussion. What's been recommended by the, by the outgoing assembly to the incoming assembly is that, th is that that discussion take place in this room, uh, in a public forum, televised, uh, with Hansard uh, proceedings taking place, uh, where every member will go sort of around the table and publicly state what it is they want to, be, want to have included in the priorities for the, for the next legislative assembly. And that is really the start of um, the priority setting process, which David will talk, uh, talk to a bit, um, a bit more here in a moment. Um, after that, uh, you know, the next big item is on the 16th of December, uh, which is the date that we have scheduled for the Territorial Leadership Committee. And that's when, you know, the Premier and the Cabinet, um, the Speaker, uh, will likely be selected by uh, one method or another. And then finally, a session on the, uh, a formal session of the Legislative Assembly on the 17th of December to make those appointments official and get the, uh, the business of governing underway. Now, it's at this point, following that red dot on the calendar here, that typically in our system of government, a major disconnect happens. The members have agreed upon a set of priorities as a group, they've selected a cabinet, they start working on, on selecting a standing committee system, and they go their separate ways. Cabinet goes off to start working on a budget, a set of business plans and a budget, standing committees start their orientation procedure, and then there's really this a uh, pretty clear line in the sand that's, that's drawn um, about the rest of their relationship. David's going to talk to you a little bit about how the outgoing assembly has made recommendations in terms of how to keep uh, the discussion going in public and in private uh, between um, the legislative and the executive branch. Once we get into January, we're into cabinet orientation briefings, committee orientation briefings, and the first session of the legislative assembly is scheduled to start in mid-February which is about two weeks later than what it normally, when it normally starts. Um, and that session will start with a speech from the throne uh, called in the Northwest Territories a commissioner's opening address, which we hope will lay out, the, um, sort of lay out in broad strokes the, the priorities for the uh, 18th Legislative Assembly. Uh, the other thing that's got to happen uh, during that uh, roughly two-week period is because it's pushing up against the end of the fiscal year, interim supply has to be um, uh, voted. In other words, um, the legislature has to adopt enough money to get it into the first quarter of the new fiscal year because they will not be in a position to adopt a budget necessarily. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a quick layout about you know, what the first 190 or 100 days looks like. Um, and this is not a typical year. In a typical year, things happen a little bit differently. We, we uh, normally get a budget done in February and March uh, and, uh, and we're not quite as late starting, but election years are not typical years. So uh, before I hand it over to David to talk about uh, priority setting, I want to talk just a little bit about leadership selection. And you know, this is perhaps the most high profile uh, aspect of consensus government. The TLC that takes place, the Territorial Leadership Committee that takes place is largely the focus uh, of the next 90 days, uh, for better or for worse. Um, on a party-based system, I think we're all quite familiar, after an election, uh, the leader of the, uh, of the political party that has returned the most members to Parliament is asked by the Governor General to form a government. We've just been through this in Canada. Uh, once, that once that leader, political leader, is asked to form a government, that leader then proceeds to select a cabinet. Uh, we've just been through this at the federal level as well. And the cabinet is sworn in by the Governor General. And then that group of, of the Prime Minister, or the Premier and the Ministers form a collective body called the Ministry. And their job is collectively to govern. And they govern so long as the, the, the House, be it uh, the Parliament of Canada or, a or the provincial legislature, have confidence in them to continue governing. If it's a majority-based system, that usually lasts four or five years. Um, that's not how it works in the Northwest Territories. Uh, far from it. Um, so first of all, again, just to reiterate, nothing that I'm about to explain to you is written down anywhere. It's purely a matter of convention. Uh, it's entirely subject to approval and uh, adoption by the next Legislative Assembly, and it is up to each Legislative Assembly to determine how they do this. But since the division of the Northwest Territories, it's been fairly consistent. It's often referred to as the 222 system. I like to refer to it as the S1222 system. Uh, 
In other words, um, the House, when it first sits, proceeds first to select the Speaker uh, by secret ballot. It then proceeds to select a Premier at large by way of secret ballot. And then a Cabinet consisting of six Ministers representing three uh, unique geographical areas. Those constituencies largely north of Great Slave Lake, those constituencies in the city of Yellowknife, and those constituencies south of Great Slave Lake. And hopefully we'll leave some time for questions to maybe explore a little bit about what those, those regions mean. Um, the, the, the process itself is a public process. The Territorial Leadership Committee, uh, since uh, the 14th Legislative Assembly has been, including the 14th Legislative Assembly, has been a public meeting. It takes place on the floor of the chamber, and essentially um, the floor is open to nominations for each of those positions. And I'll just talk about the Premier for a moment, and the, the process is largely the same for the other, uh, the other positions. The floor is op open for nominations uh, for the Premier. Um, if there are more than one, if there are, and we have had acclamations for the position of Premier, if there are more than one, the House proceeds to a, a series of successive um, secret ballots. Let's assume there are three candidates for Premier, as there were at the beginning of the 17th Assembly. If one does not emerge after the first ballot with a majority of votes, in other words, te in other words 10 votes, the person with the lowest number, or the, the nominee with the lowest number of votes is then struck from the ballot, and another round of voting takes place. And that continues until one person emerges with a majority of, of votes, be it uh, anywhere from 10 to 19. And then that process is, is uh, repeated for each of those regional, uh, um, th those regions within the Northwest Territories for Cabinet. Once that, that sort of informal process takes place here, we go into the, into the session on the, the 17th of December, and those appointments are individually ratified. And it's an important distinguish, uh, distinguishment. The Cabinet, unlike uh, in, the, in the federal or provincial scene, does not form a, a monolithic ministry or entity. The Premier and each of the Ministers are appointed individually by the House, and they each individually enjoy the confidence of the House. Uh, and it you know, raises real questions, and David and, and uh, a colleague of ours have written about the existence of the Confidence Convention uh, in the Northwest Territories, and um, you know, my view is that each of the Ministers and the Premier enjoy the individual confidence of the House. So the Premier does not get to pick his or her own Cabinet. They are basically um, presented with a Cabinet from the Legislative Branch. Um, the Premier uh, also, and, and I think um, importantly, cannot dismiss members from Cabinet, uh, which is one of the fundamental powers and, and, uh, and um, authorities of the Prime Minister of Canada or the Provincial Premiers. What the Premier can do is appoint the portfolios that each Minister is, um, is assigned and can remove those portfolio assignments or switch them around. And that is largely the extent of the Premier's formal powers. Uh, so in that sense, the Premier in the Northwest Territories is truly a first amongst equals. We don't see the same concentration of power in the Prime Minister's office or the Premier's office in the Northwest Territories as we would uh, south of 60. This has largely been the, the process since division. There have been some minor amendments to it, some tweaks, uh, but uh, despite, um, you know, despite countless hours of discussion and debate uh, ab around it, the current system seems to have some resilience. Um, but uh, it is not written in stone, and it is subject to change. So before we, we talk about that, David, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the priority setting process. Thanks, Tim. I mentioned uh, at the outset that um, we were going to focus on two <coughs> primarily distinct aspects in the consensus system, those being leadership selection, which Tim just described, um, and now the priority setting process. Um, and particularly, I want to say those are distinct, particularly that's in contrast to what we know, how, how this Westminster uh, parliamentary democracy functions uh, in provinces and at the federal level and, and, and Yukon as well. With respect to the priority setting process, I think it's, it's really helpful to lay out the dis distinction starting from the election process. And that is that, as many of you know, in a party-based system, when um, individual candidates and the party as a whole uh, are running an election, they very typically, especially in modern times, have a mandate, literally a document that they can hold up and say, you elect me and my party on this Monday, and starting the next day, we will start to implement all of the things we have said in this mandate. Right? So we know in the front end process, generally speaking, that as Tim said, the party that gets the most number of seats, generally speaking, the leader of that party will be appointed as the first minister. And then uh, the party uh, in their formation of government will begin the process of implementing all of those things they held up in their campaign platform, or what they would then call their governing mandate. 
That's not the way it is here in the Northwest Territories. Tim has described the distinction in terms of the leadership selection process, and it's also quite different in terms of the priority setting process. In many ways, the way I described it is also an, in, it's an inverted process. So whereas in a party system, the person who is most likely to be the leader if the party wins and the mandate that's most likely to be implemented if the party wins is known in advance of the election campaign or introduced very early on in the election campaign, in our system, those decisions are taken after the general election. Uh, about three weeks after the general election, the Territorial Leadership Committee will be held and the leadership will be selected. And then the priority setting process begins from there as well. We entitled this talk, Consensus Government in Transition, in part to illustrate not only uh, the distinct aspects of the transition process in the Northwest Territories, but also to talk about the system itself in transition. And to illustrate or underscore the fact that it can change. And this year it has changed, so far. One of the ways it changed is in preparation for transition, the Legislative Assembly decided to strike a special committee on transition matters. And that committee's job was to write a report, essentially setting out the context, what they would see as the potential context for the 18th Assembly, as well as to make some recommendations on the way in which we practice consensus government. One of the recommendations made by that special committee was to adopt a new process convention on priority setting and reporting. And it's distinctly different from what's been done in the past. In the past, generally speaking, towards the end of the orientation period, caucus has gathered, as Tim said, in that room on the second floor and discussed amongst the 19 members what should be the priorities for the forthcoming legislative term. Those priorities have then been publicly stated at the end of the day or the next morning. And then the process is handed over to the executive branch of government, cabinet, and the public service to go away and figure out how to operationalize that in the business plans and budgets of government. Figure out what all the programs and services and policies and new amendments to acts that should be coming forward to address those priorities set by caucus. Uh, as Tim illustrated, that leaves a bit of a gap. Um, not only a, a gap in terms of timeline, um, because the caucus priorities are set at the, end of at the end of the orientation period and it's months before the executive branch is coming back with draft business plans. But also what I describe is a bit of a cognitive gap because it can be difficult for MLAs to draw a clear line between all of the priorities that were set at the end of the orientation period uh, and the specific programs and services that are laid out in the business plans and in the budgets. And members recognize this gap themselves, particularly the members who serve in the special committee. So what they have proposed, and this was adopted by the outgoing uh, 17th Assembly, but is still subject to ratification by the incoming 18th Assembly, is essentially a four-step process. The first step will be, uh, as Tim mentioned, all 19 members as individual members will stand up in this house in a public forum and state what they as individual members think should be the priorities for the forthcoming legislative term. Right? Um, that gives those members and the entire public an opportunity to reflect what was heard in the election campaign, to reflect their own personal views and values, and to comment on some of the things they most likely campaigned for over the past month. That's the first step a statement by each of the individual MLAs. The second step will again be for caucus to gather and discuss amongst the elected representatives, amongst the 19, what they see as the vision for the forthcoming legislative term. What are the big issues? What are those big priority issues that they as a, as a collective should be addressing over the next four years? The third step, uh, and this is perhaps uh, the most distinct change of how we've done things in the past, is during this period in January and into early February, the government, cabinet, is going to be drafting a mandate. That mandate won't be drafted in isolation. Uh, they'll certainly be receiving briefings from the public service. There'll be frequent um, conversation between individual cabinet ministers and uh, what we call regular MLAs. There'll also be formal conversations between cabinet as a body and regular MLAs through caucus. And surely cabinet is going to be interested um, in the views of other individuals as well. But over the course of about six weeks, cabinet is going to develop what we we'll call a government mandate. And then they will have the responsibility for bringing that mandate to the House. Bringing that mandate to the people's representatives in the form of a commissioner's address, in an actual document that's tabled uh, by the premier in this assembly. And then that mandate will be debated in committee of the whole, uh, potentially could be amended, uh, and will be voted upon. Um, and will be voted up or down, and some members uh, may, uh, may vote against what the mandate is that uh, the Cabinet brings. 
the thinking behind that, as I understand it, is that it allows for an interim step between the caucus priorities and that big vision statement and those detailed programs and services that can then come forward in budgets and business plans. And it provides a bit more of a linkage or, or, a, or a thread uh, between those things, hopefully at the level of, of strategic direction. Uh, and so one of the examples I'd like to use is if caucus says that education should be a priority, uh, this legislative assembly should be focused over the next four years on education. Then one of the points of strategic direction that cabinet might come back with is say, we as a cabinet think, yes, education, of course, we're going to reflect that priority, and we're going to do it by focusing on early childhood education, as opposed to a university, or skills training for adults, or any other major form, major education initiative, right? That is to say, cabinet is going to make a choice. Right? Those choices will have to be made in dialogue, and then those choices will have to be put before the Legislative Assembly. This is the process that the Special Committee on Transition Matters and the outgoing 17th Assembly recommended. I mentioned four steps, so there's three. The individual MLAs making their statements, caucus setting a vision and priorities, and cabinet coming forward with a mandate. The fourth step is for a mid-assembly review, for a period of reflection roughly halfway through the four-year term of the assembly for all members to stop and say, let's re-examine our priorities and make sure we've still got this right. Because surely in the next two years, there will be changes in the operating environment. We know that the world doesn't look the same as it did four years ago from now. Um, to take an example, to make some sort of mid-course correction because of a change in the operating environment. It allows members the opportunity to have that conversation, um, to make changes if necessary, and then to continue on through the remainder of the term. So that's the process that was uh, recommended and ratified by the outgoing 17th Assembly, um, but still remains to be reviewed, discussed, and ratified uh, potentially uh, or changed by the uh, members of the incoming 18th Assembly. So that's in terms of process, um, but of course there's a big part in that, and that is that these 19 members elect um, have to think about how they're going to arrive at these priorities, how they're going to arrive at what they want to say as an individual, the contributions that they're going to make to the caucus discussion, um, and how they're going to um, contribute to the development of the government mandate. And to speak more about the kinds of things that might be uh, in the minds of an MLA when they're thinking about priority setting, I'll turn it back uh, to Tim. Thanks, uh, David. You know, if, if you look at, the, at these broad vision statements that have been developed by caucus and, and the legislative assemblies since division, uh, you know, many of them are, are very, very high level, uh, very broad, um, full of what you might call motherhood statements. Um, important, but um, the, the problem with some of these documents is, is twofold. A, uh, they don't provide a great deal of direction for cabinet. In other words, cabinet can't look at this and say, Okay, we've got some clear marching orders from this uh, because of the high-level nature of, of some of the statements. And the opposite side of that is it's, it doesn't provide a great deal of um, um, usefulness uh, for regular MLAs to then hold the government to account. And this is where this disconnect happens often, uh, where the cabinet comes back with very specific proposals. Members wonder, uh, regular members wonder, you know, where this stuff came from? How does it relate back to these very broad priorities? And then there's this accountability gap that... Um, that, um, that often exists. Uh, you know, there's not many measures of su success or failure on this, but I think one of the measures of failure that we often discuss is if we get a set of visions and priorities that everyone agrees on. Uh, it's the old adage that if everything is a priority, then nothing is. Uh, and priority setting is about choices. And choices to do something must always be, in, a, in, a, in an environment of scarcity, choices not to do something else. So in the past, the process has largely been about putting 19 people in a room and talking it out until we come out with a, a, doc with a document that everybody can live with. And, um, and the thinking of the special committee was that we need to find a way to get started off with some, with some tough choices. 
So the next slide here just shows a little bit about what, what goes into that early roundtable discussion here. Again, this is a small slide, so you've got copies of it with you, I think. Sort of the, um, the, the chopped up map of the Northwest Territories up top shows some of the inputs that we think will go into the priority setting process that starts with this roundtable discussion in the House. And the first one, obviously, the most important one you can see is, is the pink square with Great Bear Lake in the middle, and that's the election campaign. That's the part that we've just come off of. Members have just come off a very direct, or members elect have just come off a very direct, very intense, very personal consultation process with the public. And uh, we think that is the most important aspect that they bring into this priority setting process. And um, while um, uh, religiously apolitical and objective, the public service has been paying attention to what's been said on the campaign trail and has been uh, tracking it in an effort to find commonalities. Uh, the second uh, input there, of course, are recommendations from the 17th Assembly. Um, one of the long-standing features of consensus government is this idea of continuity, which uh, you know, has been drawn into question a little bit in the last few days. But for the most part, uh, you know, a strong majority of members of an incoming Legislative Assembly were members of the outgoing Legislative Assembly. So it always raised questions, do we need to start with a blank slate when we're dealing largely with a majority of, of returning members? That's not the case this time, uh, and it could uh, very well change, uh, change uh, the way that priority setting takes place. But nonetheless, the outgoing Assembly has made recommendations to the incoming Assembly, both in terms of substantive priorities and in terms of some procedures. The Leaders' Roundtable discussion, um, that's what I, I've already mentioned to you, is this discussion that's scheduled to take place between Aboriginal government leaders as well as representatives of the Northwest Territories Association of Communities. Um, we've got what we call ongoing actions, and these are sort of the actions that the Public Service of the Northwest Territories has been tracking, or actions that sort of died on the order paper at the end of the last assembly. You know, there, there were discussions late in the last assembly about uh, regulations concerning hydraulic fracturing, about the establishment of an ombudsman's office. Those were left open. Uh, but we have tracked them, and, and the, the special committee uh, from the 17th Assembly has actually included them in the report to make sure they don't fall off the table. Uh, and the final uh, input that we see in the priority setting process is, is what we call the key issues on the agenda. And this is the public services view in terms of what the challenges are facing um, the next uh, incoming assemb assembly. You'll see here something called an issues wiki, where we hope to establish a, a program of self-study for incoming MLAs. What typically happens in that second week is we bombard them with hours and hours and hours of technical briefings from public servants. And we know that after day one or two, we've lost most members. Uh, so one of the things that we've, we've established uh, in cooperation with the Cabinet Office is a, a wiki type system where members can drill down as far into issues as they want to. And, and I believe, David, that that's going to be a public document as well at some point, the issues wiki. You're not emphatically nodding, so maybe <laughs> I'm, I've, I've misstated that. Misstated that. Um, so those are sort of all the inputs that, that go into this roundtable discussion that takes place on the floor of the House. Um, and then after that, it's largely um, the process as David has laid out. Um, caucus sets priorities, the government establishes a mandate, uh, and, um, and that mandate is put before the House and is adopted by the House and then is reviewed periodically throughout the life of the Legislative Assembly. Um, so David, do I turn it over to you now? I think to talk about... Uh, uh, how do we? How do these become? Um, these priorities become programs and services. Sure. Um, it, it's probably fair to say that the caucus priorities in the past, because they have been broad in, in terms of the priorities, they they haven't necessarily itemized all of the things that government do. Um, but business plans and budgets certainly do, because all of the activities of budgets need to be accounted for, and the executive branch of government needs to propose that spending here in the legislative assembly and have members of the Legislative Assembly um, ratify those, those proposals for spending. That's, that's a fundamental aspect of responsible government. So it is important to note that there's a lot of what government does um, that will likely be ongoing. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm, I don't know the, the history in this area very well, but I think it's reasonable to expect that at one point we had perhaps student financial assistance, but not necessarily a student financial assistance appeals board. And sometime in the past, somebody realized that appeals needed to be made and perhaps the minister wasn't the best person to adjudicate those appeals. So somebody had the idea, why don't we create a Student Financial Assistance Appeals Board? Uh, that's been established for a number of years and I think there's a general expectation by the public 
that it will continue to be funded uh, into the future. Now, of course, it's the purview of all members of the House. If Student Financial Assistance <laughs> Appeals Board becomes a major issue of political discussion to say either, you know, stop, we shouldn't be funding this program, or we shouldn't be funding it at the same level, um, or we need a change in direction, this isn't the working the way it should be, or yes, this is fine, continue on, let's focus on what the bigger priorities are. The point I want to emphasize is that a lot of what government does isn't necessarily going to be reflected in the caucus priorities or in the strategic direction from this particular year, but a lot of what government does in terms of its programs and services is a cumulative reflection of all of the priority statements over the past number of, well, 17 assemblies and soon to be 18, um, that have put all these programs and services in place. But it never takes away um, from the right of, of Cabinet and of all members of this House to ask questions about how we're doing things, and if it's not working, find a different way to do it. Yeah, and just, you know, I think our final, my final word at least on, in terms of consensus government is uh, to reiterate the point that notwithstanding, uh, and I think in consideration of, of uh, the criticism and the discussion that, that often takes place this time in an electoral cycle and the fact that we're not here to defend it, is that consensus government is at its heart uh, a parliamentary system and it's a system based on responsible government. And what responsible government means uh, is that there is an executive branch that is uh, accountable to a legislative branch. It's one of the, the, the big differences between city government and, and parliamentary government. And, uh, but you know, so that, that's alive and well in the Northwest Territories. What's different in the Northwest Territories in, in uh, the consensus system is that those members who are not part of the executive branch do not form an official opposition. Uh, an and an official opposition, by the way, is uh, a very formal body. It is a, a body that presents itself uh, to the Governor General or to the Lieutenant Governor as a government in waiting uh, or as an alternative to the existing government. In other words, the official op opposition is there to critique, uh, to monitor the activities of the government and present itself as ready to govern uh, if necessary, if, if the governing party loses the confidence of the House. Um, the accountability side of that equation is alive and well in the Northwest Territories. Regular members do not present themselves as a government in waiting. They are not there on principle to embarrass, to discredit, uh, and to defeat and, and replace uh, the government. What that often means on the floor of the House is that things are not quite as lively, they're not quite as theatrical, um, and uh, in my view, at least my limited view, that is a sign of a, a strong, well-functioning uh, parliamentary democracy. That debate, I think, is largely uh, very genuine, uh, very meaningful, and, and very well thought out. Not necessarily great TV, uh, but um, uh, in my biased opinion, I think uh, much more thoughtful than, than is necessarily the case in a party-based system. So how do members do that? Uh, you know, once, um, once this priority setting uh, mechanisms are and this new process is put in place, the cabinet and the, re and the regular members uh, slip into um, the more traditional roles of the executive and the legislative branch. What that essentially or what that is often uh, uh, summarized as is the executive proposes and the legislature disposes. In other words, it's the executive's uh, role to lead, to make budgetary and legislative and policy proposals. It's the legislative uh, branch's government to receive those proposals, to anal analyze them, critique them, uh, approve or reject them, and then monitor them. And in terms of monitoring, uh, our, our system of government works in largely the same way as you'd see uh, on, the, on the floor of a of the House of Commons or, or on the floor of a provincial legislature. Members do it by asking questions, making statements in the House. They do it uh, with reliance upon independent statutory officers, people like the Auditor General, the Access to Information Protection and Privacy Commissioner, the Languages Commissioner, the Human Rights Commission. Those are all extensions of the legislative branch appointed very independently from Cabinet, very independently from the executive branch to assist members in holding the government to account it's done through the annual budget process, which could be a, a two-hour discussion uh, in and of itself in terms of how that, that process differs in consensus government, uh, through substantive motions on the floor of the House, replies to the opening address, uh, through the initiation of public inquiries, and from time to time, leadership reviews, either broad leadership reviews or leadership reviews on the um, performance of individual ministers. Consensus government is by no means a perfect system. Um, it, uh, it has uh, many, many uh, areas where it does not perform as well as traditional party-based systems, and in my view, many areas where it performs much better 
Uh, in all cases, I think when we talk about change in consensus government, though, we need to view change um, <coughs> largely from an economic perspective. In other words, change is often uh, almost exclusively initiated for the purposes of improving a system, but it's very seldom that those improvements come without some costs. And I think whenever we consider change, it's important to look at both sides, uh, you know, what it is that we're trying to achieve and, and what the implications may be uh, on the system other, other than that. So that, that includes all I had to say. David, any f closing words? No, it's great. Thank you.